Good afternoon. I am Cadet Third Class Jordan Brown, a member of the NCLS Executive Team, and it is my privilege to welcome you to the closing ceremony of the 26th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. We would like the members of the following groups to please stand and be recognized, as their generous donations have made NCLS possible. The United States Air Force Academy Class of 1959, our flagship supporter, the Class of 1973, the Class of 1974, the Class of 1993, the Association Graduates, the United States Air Force Academy Endowment, the Falcon Foundation, and the John and Lynn Muse Educational Foundation. It is now my privilege to present to you the final speaker of the 2019 NCLS. Brigadier General Andrew Armacost. General Armacost is a graduate of ROTC from Northwestern University and holds a master's and PhD from MIT. At the US Air Force Academy, he has held the positions of instructor, professor, permanent professor, department head, and since 2013, dean of the faculty. As dean, he oversees the annual design and instruction of more than 500 undergraduate courses for 4,000 cadets in 32 academic disciplines, directing five staff agencies and over $350 million in resources. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Brigadier General Andrew Armacos. Thanks. Great, please have a seat. Good to see everyone. Holy smokes, we have a full house. Well, NCLS is coming to a close, and uh, if, if you're like me, you had an amazing two days of hearing some absolutely stunning speakers, and I look forward to this event every year simply because of what it means to the U.S. Air Force Academy and to our nation. So uh, congratulations to those who organized this. We'll thank them here in a minute, but um, and uh, all the people who have come, uh, thank you so much. And I thought we'd do a, a quick video montage of uh, what we saw over the last two days. Here we go. Wonderful. What an absolutely great set of uh, presenters. And I know I wanted to offer my thanks um, to all the folks who came from far places uh, to come here and celebrate this event with us. And uh, if you came uh, from either the city of Colorado Springs, from Denver, from across the US, or even across the world, thank you for being here. How about a round of applause for our visitors? And events like this aren't possible without those who choose to come here and offer their words of wisdom to us. And I'm not sure which of our speakers are still here for today, but how about a round of applause for them as well? And as I mentioned, there are so many people who make an event like this possible, the entire CCLD staff, uh, but most importantly, Danielle Brines. I don't know where Danielle is, but uh, Danielle, please stand up. She, she runs this event. And, uh, 
through her hard work, um, we pull off the, the most amazing event uh, that we host every year. So congratulations to Danielle and the rest of the CCLD staff. And then later on in, in my remarks, I'll be sure to thank all the cadets as well, because there's one in particular who put her heart and soul into everything that happened at this event. So it's, um, this is my actually 20th year at the Air Force Academy, and I've seen, I've seen NCLS through its growth over the years. And, and trust me, um, the caliber of the speakers that we had this year was just absolutely top notch. And uh, it's grown in its prestige, it's grown in the number of people that we welcome into the, into the Air Force Academy each year. And so wh whether we're welcoming leaders from across the Air Force and the DOD and them sharing messages of contemporary importance to each and every one of us who are in uniform, um, we thank them for being here. The members from across our society who have amazing stories of triumph and amazing stories of overcoming all the odds, um, their stories really matter to us as well. And then we have persons from across the nation who saw a need in, in some area of our society or our, our global society, and they took steps to, to fill that gap and to make a difference in the lives of, of others, of other human beings. And so those groups of folks, um, just a tremendous opportunity to welcome them in. And this has happened now for 26 years where we bring all these groups of people together to share their stories. And as I reflect upon the 20 years, there's several folks that I think about. Uh, in particular, uh, just a couple examples that I look back. About 10 years ago, we hosted um, uh, Brittany and Robbie Burquist, uh, who started at the ages of 12 and 13, a nonprofit, a national nonprofit called Cell Phones for Soldiers, where they recycled cell phones and turned that in to phone credits um, so soldiers and airmen overseas could stay in touch with their families. It was an absolutely remarkable story about how two young people saw that need and, and filled that need uh, through their hard work and their, their focus on, on leadership and organizational management. And then there was Steve McDonald from a few years ago. Um, he was a detective in New York City who was paralyzed when he was shot um, in the neck and uh, became a quadriplegic. And uh, he continued his service on the New York City Police Department, uh, serving as a detective even though he was uh, a quadriplegic. The most amazing part of his story is the forgiveness and we heard that in a couple talks today, the, the aspect of leadership as, as a forgiving um, discipline as well. And so the forgiveness that Steve McDonald showed to, all, to his, his, um, his, the person who shot him uh, was a tremendous story. And the fact that he was able to overcome such odds was absolutely remarkable. And uh, another one that jumped out uh, to me was Alex Sheen, um, who started uh, an organization called Because I Said I Would. And so this was a story of personal accountability and how he created an organization that would promote personal accountability and people owning their actions and making promises to live up to those expectations. And so when we have people like these uh, and many others um, who come here and share their stories, it certainly has an impact on each and every one of us. And so what this means to me, NCLS means to me, as one of our Academy's senior leaders, is a chance to reflect on the successes of others and to learn from the mistakes uh, and the successes that they've had. In addition, it's a chance for me to reflect personally on my own actions and the things that I could do better as a leader um, to, to better serve the Air Force and, and to better serve our society. And then to share our thoughts and our reactions. So nothing is more rewarding after, in the aftermath of, of an event like this, to go with your peers and to talk about the things that you heard. And so I challenge you to do this um, over the weekend. So if you're shredding the gnar up, on, up in Keystone or, or doing something, take off the goggles, turn to the person on the ski lift next to you and say, hey, let me tell you about uh, what I just saw. Um, there's an opportunity to share these interactions uh, with each other. And I know that General Wilson, in his opening comment, said, over the next two days, you will hear stories and you will share stories. And folks, these two days are just the beginning, hopefully of a year of discussions with, with yourselves, uh, with the people who you work with, with your professors, with your commanding officers, um, with anybody who's a mentor to you so that you can share and reflect upon everything that you heard here this week. And so, uh, Take advantage of this and also take forward with you an understanding of the commitment that the Air Force Academy has to developing character. Our nation depends upon what we do here at the Air Force Academy. And so as you continue the conversations, as you go back to your communities, as you talk with your parents, share what we're doing here. NCLS is an important component to the character development activities that we do here at USAFA. So take those things with you. All right.
Those were my perspectives after 20 years. But why does this matter to you? Because the Air Force Academy prides itself on how we develop leaders of character. And the way that we infuse that character into the entire Air Force starts here at USAFA. Collectively, the culture that we can build and the sense of character and leadership that we build in our cadets goes forth into the Air Force to make the Air Force an even better place. And as the Air Force faces challenges, and we face challenges all the time, uh, whether it's um, uh, cheating scandals in the missile fields or other uh, sim similar uh, pitfalls that we faced uh, with our Air Force, we can rely on the graduates of the US Air Force Academy to fill the void and to set a cultural standard that the entire Air Force can follow. So it begins with you at the early stages of your careers to make sure that we can do that for our Air Force. My wife said to me, Kathy is here somewhere, she said, hey, I want you to um, talk about something really meaningful because I know the cadets would appreciate knowing what is your philosophy on leadership. And, and granted, I think you heard a lot of great philosophies over the last two days. So I'm not gonna wax poetic about my personal philosophy other than I think uh, one thing that I think of is uh, empathy. We don't hear the word empathy tied to leadership enough, I think. And, and this is not catering to the, to the um, to hurt feelings within your organization, but rather it's understanding the perspectives and the opinions of the people who work for you and to understand how that can influence the direction of your organization. And so empathy is a very powerful component of how we can lead. And so with that theme, I figured I would do the following. I would actually offer stories of people other than myself and uh, let you hear about folks like Captain Miranda Humphrey. Um, she was Miranda Hearn when I knew her. and. Uh, she was a speaker at NCLS when she was in high school. She had started a nonprofit organization called the Sisterhood of the Traveling BDUs, right? BDUs were the precursor to our ABUs. And, uh, and so she started this organization to make high school teachers um, in California and across the nation aware of the plight of, of dependence of deployed military members. And so she started this with a friend and it had a dramatic impact uh, throughout the nation and she shared her story here at NCLS, um, oh gosh, probably eight, nine years ago. She then came to USAFA as a recruited diver and, uh, and uh, spent some time on the team, but eventually rose to the position of cadet wing commander. Um, so so her, her actions in high school certainly portended future success here at USAFA as our cadet wing commander. And, uh, and now she's flying C-17s. She's uh, just been upgraded to aircraft commander. I heard from her today. And uh, she also serves as her squadron executive officer. And she's had a tremendous career. And this is her flying in the, in the left seat of, of the C-17. So a tremendous story of her achieving amazing things. And, and the, the reason I bring this up is because the things that you've done throughout your life, and we heard this, there was a question today, I don't know if the questioners are here, but they asked General Goldfein how his life as an Eagle Scout, or how his preparation as an Eagle Scout served him in the Air Force. And so I think it's important to understand that our lives are a series of events and development experiences that ultimately build who we are as leaders. And so what Miranda did as a young high school kid certainly was part of the mosaic of activities and experiences that led to the leader that she is and will become. Okay, so that was a case of somebody doing something amazing in high school and then ending up at the top of the heap here at USAFA. It doesn't always work that way. And my guess is there are some amazing stories out here in the, in the cadet wing as well. But let me share with you Lieutenant Colonel Mike Opresco. Mike was a student from Florida. He, he came uh, out of high school here to, the, to USAFA. What was interesting about his, his high school life was he was on a commission for the Florida governor to try to reduce smoking both in youth and also adults. And so they created a prototype program that later became an organization called the Truth Initiative. And for those who were movie fans back in the early to mid 2000s, when you'd go to the movie theater, there was always an ad, an anti-smoking ad. They were generally pretty harsh. And it, you'd see this logo pop up on the screen. The Truth Initiative was founded by Mike Opresco and launched nationally in 2002. I met Mike during the spring of his senior year. He had told nobody at USAFA about his experience in high school. And I said, Mike, how can this be? You started a national ad campaign. And he said, I feel like nobody would care. I feel like what I did in high school just wouldn't matter here at USAFA. And when I heard this, it broke my heart because I know there are so many great stories of leadership 
coming out of high school as part of your experience and your growth. And I thought it was a tragedy. So I made it my mission to make sure that we hear cadet voices at NCLS. And so we've had a, a number of years where we've hosted cadet sessions where cadets can share their story. And uh, so here's Micah Presco now. He's a U-2 pilot. He's a lieutenant colonel. Um, and uh, there he is in his spacesuit. Uh, if you haven't seen U-2s, um, this is what they wear to work. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's a pressurized spacesuit because they fly at 70 to 80,000 uh, feet of altitude. And, uh, and here's a picture of him actually um, in his cockpit flying a flag in his U-2. So a pretty, pretty cool picture of Mike. And uh, here's a case, and I vowed if I ever come into contact with cadets who have had such experiences, I personally need to showcase what they've done. So today I'm going to do just that, because many of the cadets in the room have heard from me many times over the last two or three or four years. So with that, what I'd like to do is bring to the stage cadet Alex Wise. Alex, come on up. Alex, good to see you. All right, so here we go. Alex, where are you from? Tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm um, from Cadet Squadron 19, Go Wolverines. And I'm um, from uh, Bedford, Texas. Uh, it's about west of Dallas, about 20 minutes, give or take. Yeah. So tell us about your story. I mean, there's a lot of people here, probably 2,500 or so, who want to hear it. <laughs> Not to add any pressure. <laughs> so it all started in eighth grade. Uh, my life changed from there. My, uh, my dad was diagnosed with a rare type of multiple myeloma cancer. Uh, it's a blood cancer, and it hit me hard because he was a, he was a mentor of mine. Uh, he, he would always try to do the right things. He always put family first, and he would sacrifice a lot for our family. And so it was hard, hard on me especially at such a young age. Um, uh, it was a burden on me because I had to become the man of the house. My dad was too weak uh, to keep up with such an old house that was big, and we also had a pool which did not help at all. And so I had to take care of the whole house. Um, since, it was being, since it was old, I would, I, being at such a young age, I didn't know how to fix most things. So a lot of it was just looking up on YouTube of how to fix something. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, since I was going into high school, I had to excel in my academics because uh, I knew financially wouldn't we would not be able to support myself going into college. So I needed to excel in academics. And and also, uh, I used football as a, like a getaway drug uh, to help uh, get out what like depression and anger that I had. And on top of that, like, I had to excel in football because like, I was going into a high school that, was, that had a really good high school football program in the state of Texas. It's really well respected. And so I entered ninth grade. and. Uh, we had to do a science fair project for my biology class. So me and the other smart kid in the class, we teamed up. <laughs> the other. <laughs> so uh, we teamed up, and we were like, hey, we want to get an A, or get, a, get first place in the science fair project so we can have an A in the class, because our grade depended on our science fair project. And so we were stuck. Like, we did not know what we wanted to do. And so. I was like, hey, why not find an alternative uh, way of treating cancer? Because I saw how chemotherapy uh, like, affected my dad in many ways. And so he and I started doing research, and we came across upon uh, a scientist named Otto Warburg. In 1931, he won the Nobel Prize for stating that cancer has low levels of oxygen within it. And so we took that idea and we're like, hey, why not see uh, if we can take that idea and indulge cancer with pure oxygen and see if it could kill it. Uh, and so we started more, uh, more uh, uh, 
Uh, so that's my dad and my mom. So, uh, so we came across something called a hyperbaric chamber. And what it does is you lay in it for about 90 minutes, and it takes you two atmospheres uh, below sea level, and it uses Boyle's law. So as pressure increases, uh, volume decreases. And at the same time, they indulge you with pure oxygen and take anything else that uh, in the air that is not oxygen out. And so it indulges your body with pure oxygen. And so once the patient comes back up, they feel uh, all this pure, purified oxygen within them. And so we use this, and we're like, OK, uh, hey, Dad, do you mind doing this? Um, he had uh, a bad ca cancer uh, ratio, so bad cells to good cells. His bad cells were way more than his good cells, to the point he should have had kidney failure. But uh, the doctors don't know why he did not have kidney failure. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful he didn't. But, and so we sent him to that. And while he was uh, doing those treatments, uh, me and my partner were making a, a prototype of a hyperbaric chamber. Um, so yeah, I know it looks, looks nice, but <laughs> um, it worked. And so towards the end of our science fair project, uh, my dad's uh, cancer cells dropped. Uh, so it was helping, it was killing his cancer cells. And so going back to football, with, even though my dad was improving in health, it was still, he was still weak, still uh, uh, just, uh, he couldn't do anything. He was in the hospital, in and out of the hospital. And so I looked at my football coach as a mentor of mine, as a father figure. He was a, he was a good, devoted Christian which uh, I am as well. And uh, while he was trying to make a, such a successful football program, he also taught us how to be men. And so as I like how Chief Wright said it yesterday, is you have to have mentors in life. And so I used him as a mentor um, whenever times are rough. And on top of that, I saw my football team, my, play, like my fellow players as my brothers. They had my back. So from there, we, uh, I continue on with my dad on trying to find a way to actually kill his cancer cells. Even though hyperbarics was helping, it was not curing him. And so we wanted, we wanted to try to figure out a way to cure him. And so over the years, I did internships at University of Miami uh, and uh, University of New Hampshire dealing with cancer research. And so with my knowledge that I gained from the, uh, those two uh, universities, I started applying those, those knowledges to my dad. And my dad would take them, because my dad's also smart. He has a PhD and something. I did not know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we were able to find another treatment that he could do. And as of right now, he has no trace of cancer in his bloodstream. Um, and as we speak, he's in the hospital right now trying to uh, do a trial that we found that will get rid of the mother cell in his bone marrow so he will be the first patient of his kind to be totally cured of cancer. And so that's my story. That's wonderful. Wow, amazing story. An incredible story, and I know that uh, you've probably derived some leadership lessons that you'd like to share as well. Any thoughts there? So the leadership I gained was um, just stepping up to be, become the man of the house. That was hard at such an early age. And plus, since we were not financially stable with all the cancer treatments um, my dad was going through, uh, we just were not fi financially stable, so I had to figure out a way by myself to just step up and be the man of the house and fix things and make sure the house looked Good, so when my dad comes home, he doesn't get depressed that the house looks like crud. Nice. Nice. And then on top of that, I would say I stepped forward and um, helped my dad recover from his cancer. Nice. Well, truly heroic work on your part. And uh, I know that with all the cadets and our guests here, um, you might have some advice for them. Uh, my advice would be to y'all, uh, life, it's like a roller coaster ride. It has its ups and downs. 
you can be at, you can be at the lowest, but just know it's a roller coaster, so there's always an up. So just wake up every day with a smile on your face, because it's a new day, and you're going to keep going up until you hit a peak, and then you're going to go right back down. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you got to you gotta, uh, uh, overcome adversity and start going back up. And so what I would say is there's light at the end of the tunnel, even though sometimes life will throw you a curveball. You just got to swing at it, and hopefully you hit it and hit it out of the park. Nice. Alex, thanks for joining us. How about a round of applause? <laughs> hey, buddy. All right, well done. Hey, I've hey, got a coin for you, too. All right. There we go. Super job. Wow. It's an incredible story. And uh, I'd like to continue this, this great, um, we have three total stories that we're going to share. The next is from uh, Cadet Cameron Smith. Cameron, can you come out and join us? Good to see you. Absolutely. All right, so as you're sitting down, uh, let us know where you're from. So I'm from Austin, Texas, and I'm in Spartan 10. Oh! There we go. Nice, awesome. And how about sharing your story with us? Okay, so I am a co-founder of the Pure Joy Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that provides aid and assistance to remote villages in South Sudan. And um, here. So there we go. Um, I'm a co-founder with the rest of my family, so my two sisters and my parents, and then me, and it's just the five of us, and we started back in 2012. And so we went over there and we saw that uh, this was the water that they were drinking, that the nearest clean water source to them was five miles away, and uh, we wanted to drill a clean water well so that they would have um, something clean to drink. And while we were there, we also saw their school. This was their school. Um, and we knew that we had to do more. Um, we saw their living conditions, and we also heard all these stats like uh, children are more likely to die by the age of five than they are to reach fifth grade. Wow. And a girl is three times more likely to die in childbirth and pregnancy than to reach eighth grade. So we just knew that we had to do more, so we started providing solar lights to students so that they were able to study during night, during the night. So uh, after they finished all of their household chores and everything, it'd be nighttime, and now they would be able to do their homework and study. We also provided some adjustable eyeglasses, which is part of our mobile health clinic, and that just comes in once a month and helps them, basically provides the essentials that they need. And we also built a church, which doubles as a, an, an adult education center. And we built a primary, and, a primary school, so an elementary and middle school. And that's where we drilled the clean water well as well, so that students would be able to get clean water as well as attend the school. Um, however, in December of 2013, civil war started back up again. And uh, that caused millions to flee. Um, either as internally displaced or refugees. And because of that, it created Bidi Bidi, which is the world's largest refugee camp. And uh, at Bidi Bidi, a, a lot of the Pure people, which is our village, um, they, they went to Bidi Bidi. And so we spoke with Empower One, which is the company that we use to drill our well. And we told them that if they drill a well there, we'll build a school there. Mm. So that's what we did. We built the school, and the school cost about $15,000. So everything over there is extremely cheap, and it's, it's very easy to, to do things. Um, and so that's, that's the new school that opened up not too long ago. And uh, this summer, we were over there, and we provided uh, textbooks for both that school and then we adopted another, like a sister school. So we provided textbooks for both of those schools since they didn't have any. And how do you teach students without any textbooks, without any material? So we provided some of uh, those um, and then we also started a scholarship program. So in Bitty Bitty, once you're there, you only get, you're allotted a 60 by 100 foot plot of land and you're given six kilograms of food per month. So you have absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And with nothing, you can't pay 
tuition. And tuition over there isn't much either. Uh, for a secondary student, so in high school, it's $10 per month per student, and that covers everything, including meals. For primary school students, it can be anywhere from a dollar to five dollars, um, depending on your grade. And so we started this merit-based scholarship program so that if you were an excellent student, all A pluses and everything, then you didn't have to pay tuition. However, we know that not everybody can get all A pluses so that um, we also did 75% tuition if you were like an A minus student and kept going down. And if you could not get any of that, you could work your way. So this right here was taken actually just last week. And um, this is a permanent structure that the students are building. So if you lay bricks and start uh, helping build the school to make a more permanent structure, then your tuition is paid for as well. Mm. And so what we're hoping to do with this building right here is uh, create a kitchen so that we could provide food for the students during lunch. And that would take a burden off of the, the parents and they wouldn't have to use some of that six kilograms of food to feed their students every day. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, like, that's, that's a lot on our plate since so we started off with 90 students in our schools. Last term there were 1,000. And since the scholarship program started, mm -hmm. there's now 1,600 students. And if we start feeding them, that's a lot of mouths to feed. And that's not something that we can handle on our own. So we're really going to have to get some help on this. Um, and you can't just roll it out for one student. Like if somebody goes in and says, I'll support one student, I'll pay the $10 or whatever. Well, you can't just feed one student, you have to feed all of them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Pure Joy Foundation. Wow, that's amazing. Thank what, you. what a great experience. And, and what leadership lessons did you learn from this? Because obviously there are many, right? Because you're, you're financing things, you're probably fundraising, you're, yes, you're doing some pretty cool things, and then of course trying to get the logistics done. Yes, sir. So the biggest thing is learning how to incentivize people. So with the whole scholarship program, we're really trying to get them to act in their best interest. And you don't want to just give them handouts because handouts creates a codependency. Like if I'm just giving them something, then that makes me feel good. It makes me want to keep giving them what they need. But then they're also dependent on you. And so codependencies isn't, isn't good. So you want to give help ups instead of handouts. Good, and I'm sure there's probably some lessons that you have for your peers because not everybody starts an international nonprofit with their family, so. Uh, yeah, well, that's the thing is that everybody, it's not about whether you have the ability to make a profound difference in the world, it's whether you have the desire. Like, we're just the average American family and we could do this on our own. Um, so you, everybody has the ability to do this. It's just whether you, or not you have the desire. Wonderful. Cameron, thanks for sharing your story. How about a round of applause? <laughs> Wonderful job. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Great. Please. Talk about making a difference, huh? Just having an idea and then helping humanity the way that uh, Cameron and her family have, have, have done. Truly amazing. And then finally, um, our third speaker uh, today is um, uh, Cadet Hendo Henderson. Hendo, where are you? Nice. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Good to see you. All right, so we'll start with the same question. Where are you from? Uh, so I am from Waco, Texas. I'm in Squadron 5. <laughs> Feed them. Hey. Yeah. Texas is impacting the world today, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. If it ain't Texas, I don't know what it is. So. <laughs> nice. And uh, how about you share your story with, with the crowd here? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. So <laughs> for me, um, my story starts back off when I was in middle school, uh, maybe 14 years old. Um, at the time, my dad was raising my brother and I by himself as a single father. And, you know, my dad worked hard. He worked long hours, and sometimes he would get off work to do more jobs for other people if it was hanging a fan or, you know, putting in a plug or something like that just to scrape up ends. Um, but unfortunately, my dad did not make enough for us to afford a place to live. And so the man you see behind us is the man that took us in. Uh, his name is Frank Brown. He didn't have much, but what he did have was uh, a, a room for us to live and 
a place to put our, uh, our stuff and, you know, just, like, be able to live together. And this is a picture of me when I graduated high school, just thanking him for all he did. Uh, for those rough three to four years from middle school all the way to high school, uh, my brother and my dad all lived in one room, and we all slept in one bed together. Um, some nights we really just broke down and just cried over and over and over. I remember there were some nights where we didn't have enough money to really afford a lot to eat. And if it was, we had maybe a single pizza to ourselves. And I remember looking over sometimes and not even seeing my dad eat. Um, this was me and my brother at the time. Uh, my brother was my rock. And just to see him hurting all the time was rough. Um, I remember growing up and lying to kids and telling them, hey, you can't spend the night at my house because um, you know, there's a, we got a flooding issue or something like that. It was, I had to lie to them because I didn't have a place to live. I was so embarrassed to tell them that. I remember packing clothes in trash bags and walking to the laundromat just to wash clothes. Um, I remember seeing my dad get his car repossessed. I remember riding a bike to, to football practice at 5.30 in the morning. I remember hearing kids sometimes make fun of me about riding a bike because the bike was really raggedy. Um, and as you can see, our uniform was white and red, but I couldn't really afford the cool looking shoes, so I had to get the, the black Nike shoes. And sometimes <laughs> you just gotta do it with Nikes on your foot. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it was hard doing all this. It was hard going to school. You know, I, I think I maybe had like D's in all my classes and I was at risk of failing again. It was hard going to school, it was hard socializing, it was hard getting good grades and coming home and acting like nothing was going on. Um, and I remember one day I was helping my dad do an odd end job and he looked at me and told me, hey, this really just apologized and told me that, you know, it was his fault for the way we were living, but it was gonna get better. And that he just needed me and my brother to continue to make the sacrifices that we need to make, continue to work hard and don't let our disability be the answer to slipping up or giving up on life. And um, that was a pivotal moment for me because for me to see my father like that, you know, a couple of, a couple of months later, we lost my grandma to cancer. And he just continued to just plug away, just work hard, do these jobs, make sure we had clothes, make sure we had, you know, uniforms to go play football, make sure we were in school, make sure that we did right making sure that we didn't break the law or become another statistic in the society. And, um, you know, it paid off big time um, when I was able to graduate. And these two people that you see, um, this one and this one, his name is Terry Gamble. He's now the head coach at Alden Football, and he's the assistant. These two found out one day that I was skipping lunch in the locker room. And they did something that I would never forget. They, from that day forward, they packed a the lunch for me and had it ready at every football practice to make sure that I was okay. They would stop me at the practice and sometimes make sure that I had a ride. They would put the bike in the back of the truck and just take me home. But uh, the biggest thing that this one told me was that even though you're tough, it's never okay to be so prideful that you never reach out for help because people want to help you, but if you never give them the chance, they're not going to. And so that was huge for me. And uh, I owe who I am today because of him and these two. Um, as you can see, I eventually graduated. This is my dad and I in the middle, and my mother, and then my uncle. Um, my uncle was a huge part of my success here in the military. You know, after finishing high school and doing good, you know, and you know, not letting the adversity hold me back. Um, I figured, yeah, you know, maybe education is the thing that's going to get me um, successful. So I said, you know what, maybe I can go to school, but I couldn't afford it. So I was like, I'm just going to enlist. And I went to go talk to a Marine recruiter, and my uncle was like, oh, hell no, you're not, you're not, <laughs> you're not, you're not going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> he was prior Army, and he just really, like, motivated me to, like, he was like, you're too smart to not to go to Air Force. So I'm like, all right, I think I'll, I'll do it. I had never been on the plane, so I was kind of scared about that. And I go in there taking my test, and I'm like, man, how did I do? He goes, 
you did good. You, you need to do this flying job. And I was like, oh, I don't think I, I don't do planes. I, you know, I see them crash and stuff. And, <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, 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 you're, you're okay. And so I went to Lackland Air Force Base and graduated from the 320th Gator Squadron. Um, this was my MTI Tech Sergeant in Washington. He taught me a lot. Uh, he taught me about what an officer was. You know, at the time, I thought an officer was just a police officer. Uh, <laughs> he told me the enlisted ranks, and I I'll never forget what he told me when I graduated. He shook my hand, and he told me, he's like, man, you're going to be a chief master sergeant. You keep it up. And if I could see him now, you know, jokingly, I would tell him, you know, I'm on a whole nother, like, I'm on a new level. Uh, <laughs> you know, no, no shot at the enlisted. It's just, you know, he really motivated me, and just to hear him say that, kind of pushed me to, you know, work hard. Um, I eventually got my enlisted aviator wings and proceeded off to SEER training uh, for about two months. Um, that was tough. Never do it again. Um, and then I met some of my best friends. Um, when they say the military gives you some of the best lifelong friends that you'll ever have, they're not joking. These people still call me today. They still talk to me. They still tell me to make sure that I never forget how I was to be enlisted, that I never forget to support my airmen, to support the people around me, to have an impact on them, and to always strive and represent them and what the enlisted corps can put out. And so these are the people I do it for because they motivated me, they pushed me to work hard, and when I got to my first squadron, I made sure that was known. Um, I did all I could, and then, you know, my commander came up to me and he's like, hey, pack your bags because we're deploying. And so I did a, I, you know, I had to do all these deployment training spin-ups. I did a brief for the whole squadron on the classified aircraft that we were going to be tracking, the surface-to-air missile ranges and stuff like that. Uh, and I deployed. Um, <laughs> these two are awesome. This is Sergeant Thompson and Sergeant Brummett. They taught me a lot about servant leadership. Um, I've seen a lot of times where, you know, the officers sometimes, you know, like, hey, what happened about this? And sometimes it was my fault, but they would be the first one to step up and say, hey, no, 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 you know, sir, that was on me. That was uh, a, a, a tag on me. And just to see their leadership helped me grow as a person and as an airman, uh, especially at the time as a senior airman, you know, I was getting ready to do the, the staff testing. And just to see them, like, so servant and give me the opportunity to lead, to lead uh, radio communications, to make calls to the flight deck, to call out uh, air traffic, to track these aircraft, to log in the Intel laptop. Uh, it was huge for me. And they were people too. Um, you know, sometimes we get so caught up in the military that, you know, we just gotta do our job, we gotta do our job, that's it. And that's not the mentality that these people had, you know. They want you to do your job at the same time, let's get home and let's have fun together. And so we did. Uh, my commander, Colonel Duncan, was the, oh, like, he was a, the, the best commander I've ever had. Uh, he told me that, you know, you know, you got to work hard for what you want. You got to be uh, impactful. You got to care about your people, and that's what he did. He made us live together. Uh, we were a team. We were a crew. And, you know, it wasn't just do your job, get out, go home. It was, hey, let me see how you're doing. Make sure everything's okay while we're out here. Um, and he was just a people person. He opened up himself a lot. Uh, and then <laughs> I made this choice. Uh, <laughs> Um, so one day when I got back from deployment, I had some academy officers tell me, they were like, hey, have you ever thought about like going to school, you know, at the academy? I'm like, I don't even know what that is. And I remember Sergeant Butts, uh, he was a mentor from, of mine. He came up to me and he was like, hey, I think you need to go to the academy because you could represent there and you can get this education that you want. But more specifically, he told me that he wasn't going to do any of the stuff for me. Um, a lot of times, sometimes people push stuff on people to do like, hey, you need to do this. For him, it was more so, I think this would be a great opportunity if you take it. Um, and so I did. And so I'm here today. And let me tell you, it's, it's hard sometimes. It's rough, um, especially swim class. It's, uh, <laughs> that wasn't in the brochure. Um, <laughs> you know, it's been hard, but it's been fair. Uh, I've been impacted a lot by the 18ers, 19ers, 20ers, uh, 22ers, and my fellow 21ers, Rise. Uh, seriously, though, um, I think sometimes we could get too 
you know, I, I, again, I want to go back to that too prideful thing. Uh, I'm never too old, I'm never too uh, senior to anyone to not learn from my peers, to learn from an upperclassman, to learn from a lower classman, because they teach me something about leadership, something about myself, and there's something about them every day that they come out here. Um, and you guys have all made uh, a phenomenal choice to lead and to be, uh, to do what other people won't do and what they will not do um, and what they don't care to do, some of them. And honestly, that's a humbling choice to know that one day I will be serving with you and one day that, you know, if it comes to that, I will put my, my life on the line to make sure that you're okay and to make sure our brotherhood and sisterhood is held together. Um, that's it. That's it. All right. Yeah. So, hey. So, this is the challenge ceremony. So, any mm -hmm. challenges for your fellow cadets? Uh, yes. So, specifically for the 19ers. Um, <laughs> Uh, my biggest advice for you all is to know that you get one first impression. You get one first impression with your commander, you get one first impression with the other officers, you get one first impression with your enlisted people. If you screw that one impression up, it will hold against you for the rest of your career. Um, it is, sometimes it could be. If you come out there thinking you're all that, instead of humbling yourself, uh, it, it could change your perspective of how people view you. Uh, how your airmen are going to help support you and, you know, want to get behind you. Uh, I think buy-in is huge, and if you ruin that first impression, it's really hard to build up after that. Um, for my other 21ers, um, all I have to say is just let's continue to lead by example. Let's be someone that uh, we want other people to see. We want to make the leaders that we want to have in the Air Force and to uh, continue to inspire and reach the next level. Nice. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Endo, thanks. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. And, and uh, I know your story is just like the other two. Um, just incredible that you put your heart and soul into today's event. How about another round of applause for Hendo? And <laughs> thank you. And our other two speakers, both Alex and Cameron as well. So thanks so much. Yes, sir. All right. I thought you were going to go like that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Nice. I, you know, this is, this is what I meant by understanding others' stories, um, that there are so many stories. This is just three. And out in the cadet wing, there's another 4,261 other great stories. Uh, and um, everybody uh, has done something in their lives, uh, both while they're here and before they got here. This is, this is how you create your fabric of leadership and the experiences. Um, so congratulations to all of you. And then uh, into these three in particular for, for sharing and bearing their souls. And it really means a lot to all of us. So thank you again. Um, what I'd like to do now is actually bring out, um, I mentioned earlier that cadets play an active role in the planning of this event. And so I wanted to welcome to the stage uh, the cadet in charge, Cadet Megan Vandermoss. Uh, Megan, come on out. Great to see you. Absolutely. And since this whole symposium is about leadership, teamwork, and organizational management, there's no better example of that than Megan and her team and what they've done here. So I invited Megan to the stage to share a few of her thoughts about what this event has meant to her and how it's helped her hone her uh, leadership experiences. Thank you, thank you. Um, I was just supposed to be the MC for this event. So then <laughs> Colonel General Armacost said, will you please sit on the panel too? And I said, oh, okay. So uh, I'm, I'm really you. honored to, to be up here. Thank you, sir. And uh, really uh, just honored to be up here. This is the final event, and this is exciting uh, to see all this hard work go into this and this uh, culminating thing uh, that we get to experience. And um, a lot of people ask me, what is NCLS like? What's it like to work for NCLS? And uh, the analogy that I often use is it's like being thrown in the deep end of a pool, but you don't know how to swim. But there's people treading water with you, um, around you, and eventually it takes some time, but you gather the strength and the confidence that you need in order to understand how to actually successfully organize this event. Um, so uh, I know we already gave a shout out to Miss Danielle Brines, but without her, this event would not be possible. So uh, just give her one big round of applause.
this is a, it's a beast of, a, of a, an event. And uh, the reason that I say that and I give that analogy is because this event is becoming really a national, it's a national event, national caliber event, but it's also becoming uh, bigger on a global level even. We've seen speakers, we've seen guests and visitors from all over the world. And so the challenge that I have with that as the cadet in charge is I have to manage this event that's growing, 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 which is great. We want it to grow. But I also have to keep in mind that it really comes down to it's all about you. It's all about the cadets. So how do I represent this event on a big level? And how do I represent the cadets and balance the two, right? So that's the biggest challenge that I felt that I have to face um, as the cadet in charge. So I feel honored to be able to represent uh, both sides of the spectrum there. Um, but keeping that in mind has been a, definitely a hurdle for us as we continue on with the planning process. Um, there's a lot to understand about NCLS, and I didn't even really realize that until I got into it. I lead a, about a dozen cadet teams, all the way from protocol to speakers to transportation, uh, you name it, force support. They're all working behind the scenes, and um, they've done an incredible job this whole entire event. And it really, the work, it, it, could, not, it could not happen without them. So a uh, round of applause for all those cadet volunteers, because that's amazing. You've done a great job. And so the challenge with that is, if I'm leading all these different groups, the 12 different, 12 plus different cadet teams, as well as their permanent party members, I got to know my stuff. And uh, that takes a little bit of a while uh, to understand because of, because of the level of this event. So I have to understand how protocol works, which is just an amazing thing in itself. I have to understand how the transportation works. How do we get speakers? How do we do this? How do we do that? And so that's a huge challenge for me. But um, I think that with the help of a lot of mentors and the permanent party that are a part of the NCLS team, they've really helped me. And that's where that whole being in the deep end, trying to figure out your way, um, but once you get your footing and you get that confidence, then you're like, all right, we got this. It's going to be okay. So um, another point to this uh, that I'd like to make that I really uh, think has really helped me, this is something that my dad taught me. And I know my dad's somewhere here. He's here today. And uh, he's, one thing he taught me about leadership and he, he really hammered into me is, as a leader, you've got to be decisive. So Ms. Brines has um, been an incredible woman to work for and mentor to me, and she has treated me like her counterpart, which I feel very honored to, um, to be, because she'll say, hey, Megan, uh, what do you think? You make the call. And I'm like, oh, crap, like, <laughs> what am I going to do? So uh, <laughs> my dad always said, as a leader, you make a decision, and you just got to stick with it a lot of times. And you might look at it at the end of the day and say, dang, that was kind of a crappy decision that I made. Uh, Maybe I got to kind of go back and make some apologies to people or fess up for my mistake. Um, but you still own it. You still own that decision no matter what it was, good, bad, ugly. And so that's been a, a thing I've really taken to heart. And my fiance is probably here laughing because I'm telling you all to be more decisive, but I can't even decide where to go to dinner at night. But uh, <laughs> that's the truth about it is when you're in leadership, make a decision and stick with it. Go with your gut. And uh, that's something I've tried to practice within the NCLS world because there's a lot of decisions to be made on a weekly basis and uh, to understand that um, a little bit more. And uh, the, the final thing, as I was kind of reflecting on this whole leadership theme and everything I've learned, it's kind of this culminating big event for me. It's been a year plus of planning um, to do this event, uh, believe it or not. And I was thinking a lot about what have I really learned the most. The number one thing that I've actually learned really just comes back on myself. And we've heard this a lot from different speakers here. But it's that personal leadership. It's a personal ownership. You own you, and nobody else owns you. And uh, that's an important thing, I think, that we need to remember as leaders, because when it comes back down to it, it's, it's your decision that you're making. You own that. When you make a mistake, you fess up to that. And that's really hard to do. It's so hard to say, I was wrong. I made a mistake. And um, so for me, that has uh, been a really big theme, is just that people you are a, reflex, a reflection of your own leadership. And that seems kind of contradictory, but that's the truth about it, that you, you have to own that. I think this world needs more people who will say, hey, I got this, I own this, that's me, that's on me. And uh, it would be a better place if, if, uh, if more people were like that. So that's the big kind of the leadership lessons that I take away from NCLS organizing 
um, as a whole. It's been an incredibly invaluable experience for me um, that I'll take on with me uh, next year and through the rest of my career and however long that lasts. But um, I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity, the experience, um, and it especially, especially thankful. It all comes down to the people that you work with. So for all the cadets, um, for the permanent party that I've worked with, for the leadership and their support, um, we've gotten you know, all the way from General Goldfein down, we've had support from that leadership. And that's actually so incredible uh, to our program and to what we're trying to do here. And it's continuing to grow beyond that even. So I'm really thankful for that. Uh, it's been such an honor and privilege to work alongside everybody that I've gotten a chance to. It's amazing to watch people grow and kind of find their little niche in the leadership and the organization. So any, any specific challenge that you'd like to issue, something you'd like to lay down uh, to challenge your classmates or the My biggest class thing of is, just uh, going off a little bit of what I said in my personal reflection is, take a look at yourself. How can you improve? How can you, can, how can you get better? Because we get all these leadership experiences, and you know, for every, every little bit of experience that we get learning about how to lead others, I really think that we get 10 times more learning about ourselves, and that's the truth about it. So um, take that for what it's worth and think about that as you go about the rest of the, your time here. Well, I know for a fact that you're going to take this great experience of NCLS and bring it with you on active duty. Um, yes, you sir. can't replace this type of, uh, type of experiential learning. So congratulations yes, to you and the entire cadet staff. And uh, Thank you. let me offer my thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Great job. No dabbing, right? Good job. Well, great. I, I know we're nearing the end of the hour, and uh, I wanted to um, just share a couple final thoughts and issue my own challenges to everybody in this room. And uh, there's a, it's often attributed to Margaret Thatcher, sometimes to Gandhi, sometimes to other people. Um, but it goes something like this. Watch your thoughts, because your thoughts will impact your words. Watch your words, because they will impact your actions. Watch your actions, for they will create your habits. Watch your habits because they'll define your character, and your character will determine your destiny. And so this event and the thoughts that you've created and what you've heard from all of our speakers should move you along that ladder um, to lead a character-filled life and to live up to the high expectations uh, that we have for our Air Force and for our nation. And so I jotted down a few specific challenges um, that I want you to take away. And the first is, to our speakers, if there's any speakers in the room, and even if they're not, they can watch it on, on, on YouTube tomorrow, I suppose. Um, but it's, um, it's to stay in touch with the United States Air Force Academy, that uh, our speaker core uh, represents important connections that we have. These are movers and shakers who are in touch with other speaking engagements, other cities, other universities. And please carry the message of the Air Force Academy forward. Share what we're doing here and our our absolute singular focus on character and leadership development with the other people you come into contact with. Let me offer that same challenge to all of the other visitors um, to recognize um, the Academy's focus and to bring those back to your schools and to your communities and share the great work that's going on here at USAFA. And then to the cadets um, here at USAFA, but also our ROTC cadets that are with us, um, reflect upon each of the examples that you've seen over the last two days. And then carve out, I said this before, carve out time to actively discuss what you've heard, the ideas, the principles, the thoughts, uh, and discuss those um, with others. Um, so often we say that character development is an individual pursuit, but if there's any place that teamwork comes into play, it's in the sharing of ideas about how to develop ourselves uh, with respect to our character and eth ethics. I want you to determine how you can incorporate the examples of leadership that you saw among the speakers into this mosaic of leadership that you're creating for yourselves. And you do this, right? You pick out good examples of leadership and ideas that you come across, whether it's reading books, hearing speakers, or observing people who are leading you. And so pull it together. Uh, include what you've learned over the last two days into that mosaic. Just as I talked about the, the Burquist folks, the, the, the Burquist siblings and, uh, and uh, Steve McDonald, um, I've incorporated things that I learned from them into my own life and my own leadership. Um, have high expectations of each other. Um, so having a, a sense of empathy and humility in your daily lives really goes a long way. So understanding the positions of others, um, this is an important component of having 
a, an inclusive organization, one that understands the full backgrounds of others with whom we work. Uh, so take the time to have that sense of empathy, empathy and humility. Um, search for the opportunity to create a defining moment in your life. So we heard this from uh, Chief Wright, we heard it from the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, that at some point in their careers, all of a sudden they said, whoa, what am I doing? Uh, for Chief Wright, it was when he was presenting a flag to, um, to uh, the widow of a deceased airman, and uh, he said he had this realization, what am I doing with my career? And then that was the beginning of the turn, and it obviously led to great things. And of course, General Goldfein, with his great discussion of, of of how he spent a year on a bike uh, traveling throughout the US, uh, reasserting his commitment to the Air Force Academy and to the ideals of, of this institution. So search for your defining moment. And sometimes it happens in small pieces, sometimes it's a quantum leap, you never know. Um, it depends on where you are. I hope an event like this would cause you to latch onto something where you say, it's time to make a change, or it's time to help my friends make a change, uh, because what we're seeing is not the behavior that we're expecting. So, Keep that in mind, um, even in, and don't separate your professor, professional life as when you're sitting here in uniform from your personal lives as well, which is why I gave the example earlier, while you're riding the ski lift this weekend or doing whatever, when you're out at uh, Chick-fil-A or out at um, um, out Mod Pizza, right? Um, have the conversations um, about what you heard today because again, as we develop our character, it's not just an individual pursuit. Here's why it's important. The sense of teamwork that you can create defines the culture in which we operate. The culture of our Air Force needs to be perfect. And it's your responsibility to make it so. So I challenge you to take everything that you learned, first on an individual basis, next with your peers, and then spread the ideas that you've thought about over the course of the last two days to your lives as airmen and to your lives as citizens. That's my challenge to you. And as we end today, let me bring Jordan Brown back to the stage because he has some announcements for next year. Jordan. Thank you, General Armacost, for your remarks. Can we please get one more round of applause for our Dean of the Faculty? And can we also please get one more round of applause for the amazing cadets who are willing to share their stories here today? Good job. Reflecting back on the success of this year's NCLS, the NCLS team would like to say thank you to all of those who have attended this year's event. We are so glad that you were able to join us for this amazing opportunity, and we hope that you continue to have impactful conversations beyond this week's event. We also encourage you to mark your calendars for the 2020 NCLS, which will take place on the 20th and 21st of February. We are very excited to announce that we will pick up the conversation next year with the theme of valuing human conditions, cultures, and societies. In preparation for this event, the NCLS team would like to extend the opportunity for you to recommend an NCLS 2020 speaker. If you would like to nominate a speaker, please go to our website, shown behind me, and nominate a speaker today. Thank you all for attending the 2019 National Character <laughs> and Leadership Symposium. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you next year at the 2020 NCLS. Cadets, you're dismissed.